the Possibility Hub video series. I'm Carol Talbot, the creator and founder of the Possibility Hub, an advocate for awakening, encouragement, and creating opportunities for an expansion of awareness and consciousness. My guest in this episode is John Paul Eaglehart Fitchbach. Now, John Paul is an initiated shaman, sacred pipe carrier, and sight whisperer, and his documentary series, The Shaman and the Stones, is currently in production. Now, he's a very practical, common sense shaman, guiding the spiritually curious into transformational experiences with the natural and spiritual worlds. And as a sight whisperer and plant talker, he connects with spirits to identify extraordinary opportunities to experience profound connections. In this conversation, the first of many, we explore his unusual calling and pathway into the shaman's way. excited that you're here on the Possibility Hub with us and talking about shamanism and your pathway as a shaman. So with so many people having heard that word now, and it seems to have very many different interpretations, what's your interpretation? How would you define a shaman or shamanism? Well, sure. <laughs> let's, just <laughs> dive in. let's just dive into that part. Um, I think that for me, Shamanism has to be just have to be clear that it's not a religion, that it's a spiritual practice. So shamanism is a spiritual practice. You can be a Christian and a shaman. You can be uh, any you can be any religion you want to be and a shaman because it's your spiritual practice. It's not a religion. So I think that what shamans do is they have an ability to move between realities. So if you find out that you believe and you feel that there's more happening than just this 3D physical world, and you have an ability to move in between those worlds, that's the shamanic practice. So I think that mostly what we do as shamans is travel as an intermediary between worlds for the purpose of reharmonizing. So if you talk about shamanic healing, you're saying something's out, you know, there's dis-ease, Something's out of balance in the physical. So the shaman makes a journey to reharmonize that. If the land is in, has been pillaged and destroyed, the shaman goes into that dimension of the physical realm of, um, of the earth to reharmonize. So it's about this ancient, ancient, ancient tradition of balance and that we arrive at that balance because we work with unseen spirits, entities, ancestors. So to me, that's kind of what we're talking about in shamanism. And it's just one of those ancient, ancient, ancient ways of knowing that we've used forever. And there's evidence, if you look in, you know, in history, there's, they'll see a strange carving in an archaeological dig and they'll say, oh, well, that was the shaman. <laughs> or they'll see, you know, what was this space used for? Well, it was obviously for the shaman. So modern science is accepting the fact that this role of being this intermediary between worlds has existed forever. So How's that? You say, yeah, that's wonderful. So you say it's between worlds. And of course we visit other worlds, other spaces, other places in our dreams. And is this something that you always were aware of throughout your life or something that you came across later? Because I know you've been heavily involved with the theater. Yeah, so I was the little kid that got the neighborhood kids to put on a play in the basement. And you know, <laughs> I cast everyone and rehearsed everyone. So I was a theater director for all my life. The only difference is that there was a voice and this voice I would hear and the voice would tell me how to heal. So if ever I got sick, this voice would tell me exactly what to do. But because I always had this voice, I never thought, oh, I'm hearing a voice. It was just completely normal. I suppose the odd part of that was that I didn't actually think everyone had a voice. It just, I, I don't know, for some reason, it didn't occur to me that it was special or it wasn't special or other people had it or didn't have it. I don't know. It was just something that I had. So that was the only strange, abnormal, shamanic thing that was in my childhood, I think, that I can recall. And then it wasn't until I was directing operas in the city of Chicago 
<laughs> at the time of my Saturn return, which is that 28 year cycle that we go through. And my understanding of that is that every 28 years, your soul comes knocking on your consciousness and says, is this what you want to be doing now? Is this what you should be doing now? <laughs> I'm laughing because I know what happened at my Saturn return. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. You know, everything changes. And a lot of people, I, I think, find that at the age of 27, 28, 29, big shifts. It can be, uh, you know, a relationship falls apart. The, the job that you thought you'd have for life falls apart. You move country. Things change. Things, things shift. And not always for the worse. It can be for um, the better. Um, and sometimes it doesn't seem that it's for the better at that time. It's like your, your reality crumbles in some way and like, ah, you're kind of like pushed. Um, like yeah. you say, there's that big knock on the door. And if you don't listen, then it knocks louder and opens the door for you. Yeah. So it was similar. It was similar for me. I, uh, I was directing a, a bunch of plays in London at the time. So I would have been uh 23 maybe 24 probably about 23 years old and a friend came to visit an actor friend and said oh i want to go to see this to this psychic fair and i thought oh, whatever psychic <laughs> mikey okay so she was doing past life readings so she went and you go into a room and she you know does a little demo and then you book private appointments so she's we're in the room and she's going to everyone she's ah oh, yes you know cossack soldier ah oh, yes ancient Egyptian something. And she looks at me and she pauses and she goes, oh, and she goes on to the next person. So really? everybody gets something and I get, oh. So, <laughs> so my friend, you know, he was the Cossack soldier. Yeah. My friend was the Cossack soldier and he always loved doing Chekhov plays. For some reason, that canon of, of dramatic literature, he just got it. He just understood exactly what that was about. Loved Russian literature. Anyway, so he books his appointment. And I think, well, I have to book an appointment because he was, anyway. So I sign up for the appointment. I go into my, the appointment and I walk in and she pulls back in her chair and crosses her arms and says, do you have a problem with me? Really aggressive. And I'm thinking, I have no idea. So I said, um, no, sorry. And I said, she said, well, why are you here? And I said, well, I found what you were talking about interesting. So I thought I'd come and, and she said, um, well, you have, a lot of, you have a lot of spirits around you. And I said, oh? And she said, well, I'm confused. Can you give me something you're wearing? So I had a ring and I took the ring off and gave her the ring. And she held the ring and she said, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I have really, oh, oh, I am so sorry. Look, ignore everything I've said. Just go have a life, look. When it comes time for your Saturn return, everything is going to make sense. Just go have a good life for the next couple of years, because when you turn 27 on your, yeah, Saturn return, sorry, I'm really sorry. Uh, no, I won't charge you for this. <laughs> so really instilled you and inspired you with a lot of confidence to look forward to 27, 28 years old. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But what did happen when your Saturn returned? Oh, it's, it, it just gets funnier and funnier. So I'm, uh, I was a practicing Nishiren Shoshu Buddhist at the time. So living in yeah, Nishiren what? Shoshu. Yeah. So they're the nam myoho renge kyo nam myoho renge kyo chanting uh, sect of Buddhism. It was big in America at the time. I was in Chicago directing operas. And I was supposed to meet a friend for lunch. So... Oh, okay. so you weren't one of those ones with the begging bowl and shaved head. No, no, no. So no, no. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so it was you chanted in people's living rooms. So there would be like a little leader, and you just chanted, and it was about trying to create that sense of positive, putting yourself in that positive field of energy. It was Beautiful. a very cool practice. So we're supposed to meet for lunch, and we went to a vegetarian restaurant, and this is 1987. Yes, 1987. So I refer to 1987 as the, the first new age movement. So I was looking, we go into this restaurant and I'm looking and there's all these magazines for various new agey things. And I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, whatever. So I pick one up called the Monthly Aspectarian. 
Ooh. So I go to sit down and I take a booth and I'm leafing through this magazine and he does, my friend doesn't show up, it doesn't show up, but I'm thinking, oh, oh, oh no. So I'm having a cup of tea and looking at this magazine and I think, well, I'll go call back in the late eighties, um, no mobile phones and you had to, you would go to a pay phone and you'd phone your number and enter a code and hear your messages. So I thought, well, I'll see if he's left a message that he's not coming or late or something. So I go, no messages. I come back to my booth and the page is not, the magazine's been turned to another page. I'm like, well, that's a bit random. Why would someone turn the magazine page? Oh, well. So I look down at the magazine and my vision starts to go. Like it starts to get all fuzzy and I think, oh my gosh, I'm having a brain aneurysm. I'm, you know, having, who knows what's going on. So I'm getting scared and scared and the voice comes and the voice says, you'll be all right, just breathe. Just read your magazine and breathe. I'm like, but I can't see. Nothing's in focus. And I'm staring down at this and nothing. nothing. And I'm scanning the page. And the only thing in focus is a teeny, teeny, tiny little ad that says, you know, find your life's purpose, meet your spirit guides, um, white bear, Inuit shaman woman doing workshop in Chicago. It's the only thing I can read. The rest of the page is completely blurry. And I'm thinking, well, that's odd. I can actually read. This one thing is in focus. So I think, okay, so then I'm, the voice says, breathe, breathe. So I, I breathe and I'm breathing. And then it all clears. My vision comes back. I go, I was living with my sister while I was directing these operas. And so I said, the weirdest thing happened. I was at this cafe and blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, well, let me see it. And I said, what? And she said, well, show me the magazine. Oh, well, I don't have it. I'm like, John Paul, <laughs> you had this thing and you didn't bring the magazine. I'm like, no. She said, well, so we jumped in the car, we went back, got the magazine, I found the ad, read it again. And so she said, well, that's what I'll get you for your birthday. So my birthday's in September. So she signed me up for this three week course. Then somebody, some waiter at a restaurant out of the blue comes up and hands me this address. And he says, look, I, I don't know why I'm doing this. I've never done anything like this in my life, but I have to give you this address. You have to go see this uh, naturopath. Okay, so I go to the, I go to the address a um, couple of days later, the place is closed. No, not in business anymore. But next door, there's a numerologist and a little sign in the window that says free numerological reading. So I think, well, I'm here, I might as well. So I go in, I sit down and he, I give him all my dates and times of whatever. And he goes, wow, wow. Um, look, uh, you're coming up to your birthday. I said, yes. And he said, um, I just stayed home under the covers, really. I think just, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything. The, you, everything is going to come down on your head on that day. Just, just don't, don't, don't do anything. <laughs> so another inspiring message. <laughs> yes. So we start the course with the, with White Bear. And it's, it's an introduction to shamanism kind of course, it's all fine, but all kinds of things happen. Like we're, we go into her house, there's only five, four of us, five of us. Um, we go in and the electricity blows. So we're in the dark, so we light some candles. Then the window blows open and the curtains do the thing. And then all we smell are roses. It's like really, really heavy rose perfume smell. I'm like, wow, this is pretty wild. Um, so then things happen in her life and she's got to do some healing work, I think in Texas. So she said, look, we're going to have to double up on sessions. And the very last session will be on September 20th, my birthday. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So we well, meet. Were you, were you tied there? Should I stay at home and stay under the cover or should I actually turn up for this? Well, I have to, it's the last class. All these weird things have happened. Um, you know, that was just the first, the curtains and everything was, that was the first class. I can't imagine, you know, anyway. So we get to the, the last class. That day, uh, my truck was broken into, the window was smashed, my radio was stolen out of the truck. Um, uh, I almost got mugged, but I ran and got away. So it was not a good day. And so we get to uh, Susan's place for 
this last class. And she says, okay, look, uh, Spirit has told me that instead of the last class, we're gonna have your initiation test. And if you pass the initiation test, then I'm to take you on as an apprentice. So we passed the test. I became apprentice to her for a year and a day. And she passed me off to grandmothers and grandfathers and medicine people and healers all over the planet for the year and a day. Um, she sort of started it off and then I got passed from elder to elder along the way. Um, and then it wrapped up with a big, a year and a day later, a big vision quest ceremony where I had to claim my power and my healing songs and decide what my role was going to be. And it was wild. So was it during that program that you decided that, I mean, did you put the other side of your life on hold to be passed around to all these different um, shamans for initiation? Did you decide after that course, this is a path I want to pursue? I don't remember having that conscious decision. I remember thinking, okay, I guess this is what's happening now. And then it just, the opera season was over. Um, I could return back to Canada. So I was quite free because as a freelance director, you know, you don't have to take work, um, but it seemed like this was, and then it was just boom. I just couldn't, it was keep, you know, keep all your arms and legs in the vehicle at all times. <laughs> and she, it was part of the initiation. You had to, I had to give up all of my worldly possessions. So I had to give away absolutely everything. I was allowed to keep one box which had my birth certificate and some legal things that you need to live in modern society. But I absolutely gave away absolutely everything. So I didn't have any ties. I had no possessions, I had no ties. How difficult was that to do? Or was it a kind of no brainer decision because you thought, no, I'm on this path and what I'm receiving back far exceeds what I can give away. And I say this because so many people get attached to possessions and, uh, people, friends, cars, you know, what you wear, we get so attached. And I can imagine how freeing it was, but also how that it can be liberating, but it can also be very scary. It was intermittently scary. It was mostly uh, liberating and just an incredible act of faith and trust. What had happened, you know, from the time, I mean, I didn't have to do it like the next day. I don't remember. So let's say that if the apprenticeship kicked off on the 21st of September, she was down in Texas for maybe a month or so. So this was probably about six weeks after that, that this happened. So it would just, it kind of was an unfolding of that sort of the next thing to do. Um, but it was, it was, it was a challenge. And I think the harder thing was to explain to people why, why I was doing this because that's where the biggest doubts come in, is people say, well, John Paul, that's crazy. Or, you know, this sounds like a cult. Or, you know, are you having to give her money as well? So all those, you know, interferes, people enter those fears into you. And was it during that time that you started to be able to travel or be aware that you were able to travel into other worlds? Yeah. Did, did, so, you also, did your own psychic abilities and, and that voice that's always helped you with your health, did those become stronger? Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the first assignments that she, well, she gave me assignments while she was gone. And one of them was she, uh, I had two guides. So I had uh, White Bear, the Inuit medicine woman. So then, so I had her and all of her guides. Plus then I had an, another Inuit guide named Narwa, who was my personal guide through the, the apprenticeship period. So I was pretty conversant with them and they were very clear and I could see, feel, hear them. And then um, White Bear introduced me to the Council of 44 Grandmothers. And she gave me the ceremony and the song. And she said, well, no, she gave me the ceremony. She said, you have to find the song. This is the ceremony that you perform to contact the grandmothers, but you have to find the song. So that was my little assignment while she was away. So and once what, you're... I was going to say, what's the significance of the 44 grandmothers? I know 44 is a master number, but what's the significance of that? 
To be truthful, I have no idea why it's 44 and not 33 or 27. I absolutely don't know. I've asked a couple of times and they said, because it's the completion. That's the complete number. That's the number of completion. So they said, if we're, if we're the grandmothers of all time, of all earth, of all nations, of all races, we're 44. That's all I know. Okay. Now, what were some of the most impactful initiations you had during that year? Oh my gosh. Um, I was in Hawaii. Um, that's a, a fabulous hysterical story. Um, the phone rang one day and I answered and is this John Paul Fishbuck? Yes. Um, we're calling from, I don't remember who they said, um, you've won the trip for two to Hawaii. I've never, I have ne I never entered any competition. I have no idea. Anyway, so I did a little, things came in the post and uh, it was some kind of timeshare thing. So I checked in with Narwhal and said, okay, Hawaii, what's going on? And he said, oh yes, we have to hand you off to uh, Kahuna in Hawaii. So just go, you don't, you don't have to do the timeshare thing. So I grabbed, it was for two. So I grabbed a fabulous friend of mine and said, do you want to go on a really bizarre adventure? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, sure. So we landed in, in Honolulu and they had the sign up for me and we just walked right past them. I knew that I had to get to the island of Kauai and all I saw was a parking lot. So the instructions were drive north on the island of Kauai until you get to this parking lot. And I thought, but Kauai is quite small and there is only one north-south highway. So little did I know. So we're driving north and I see it. I said, oh, this is it. This is the Felicity. This is the highway. This is it. This is the parking lot. So we pull in and she said, well, what are we supposed to do? And I said, I have no idea. So we're kind of talking and we're looking at a little, a couple of brochures about the island of Kauai. So we're both, our heads are like down looking at this thing, you know, trying to see what we want to do. And there's a guy knocks on the window on the so I roll down the window and he says yo son you're late I'm late and then his huge big smile and that beautiful Hawaiian spirit of just joy you know joviality and laughter and he said oh I'm laughing I'm kidding I'm kidding I'm kidding you're fine you're perfectly on time so he leans his head in the car and he says to my friend Felicity I'll have him back in four days So the, and it, we went through the, all of the kahuna teaching. So he had a group of young men that he was initiating. So he threw me in with that bunch. And there's an experience where they take you out on what's called a hiu. So it's a, it's a bunch of lava stones that uh, make like a pier out into the ocean. And thank God, I didn't really understand. All the boys knew exactly what was gonna happen. And no one told me, and thank, thank you that no one told me. They take you out to the end of this, and then they fling you into the ocean. And either you pass and the ocean returns you to the shore or the ocean takes you. Oh. So they fling me in the ocean and I'm, I'm not a good swimmer. I can swim, but I'm not a great swimmer. And the, I'm tumbling and tumbling and these waves are crashing and I'm being you know, pounded down to the bottom of the, the ocean floor. And I just am thinking, this, this could not, this might not end well. <laughs> <laughs> so I just did the, you know, as you're taught to just surrender that these forces of nature are bigger than you. Yes. So if you keep your little solid form, you're going to get hurt. But if you expand and you move out of your little baby, solid human, delicate form, and you just expand yourself, then you're, you're at one with nature and everything will work out. So luckily I did what I was told, trained to do. So I did this whole expand thing. And then this wave came, pushed me up, and pushed me to shore with my head above the water and spat me out onto the beach. So that was one of the more horrific initiation experiences. And then to end the sort of year and a day, uh, I think he went on a vision quest because isn't yeah. the purpose as it all comes together and when you're initiated, um, to really have your purpose and what you're going to be gifting into the world. So tell us about yeah. how that came about. So I was passed to so many different tribes. So I was taken through various men's initiations. So some of this I can't talk about and some of it I can. Um, but 
different tribes have different understandings of what a, a medicine man, so male medicine person, a male shaman's role is. And so I, it was kind of like, I jokingly say it was like the shaman sampler pack. You know, I tried a little bit of herbalism. I tried a little bit of healing work. I tried a little bit of divination. You know, you, you know um, I did the talking to dead people thing. Uh, so at the, at the end of that, it's important that you pull that all together and you say, well, what is it that not only do I like to do, but that I feel I can do in connection with spirit. So it's not necessarily that you know, that that's particularly my gift. But I know that when I go into that place, spirit and I work really close, excuse me, really closely together. So because of my theater training, it was being a ceremony man. So I would go, like when I was with the Kiowas, I did the ghost dance with them. So it was highly illegal at the time, but I had seen the vision of how I was to be painted. And they said, well, you know, you have to prepare for the ghost dance for a year. You don't just ghost dance. And so then I came to, the, to my teacher and I said, I had a vision last night of myself all painted. And I described the painting. And he said, well, if you've seen the painting, then you might as well dance. So it's about being taken into ceremony, lots and lots of ceremony, um, being given, you know, uh, given songs, given sweat lodge ceremony to lead, being asked to lead lots of ceremonies. So I was pretty clear that somehow the whole directing theater thing was coming together as a ceremony man, but intertribal. So it wasn't ceremonies in one particular tribal, you know, tradition. And it was lots of inventing ceremonies for people. So that was, I knew that that was going to be part of it. So for the, the vision quest, you're sent out into the woods for, you're, you're well prepared. You've learned all of your herbal stuff. You've learned all of your water stuff. You've learned all of your energy work. So you're thrown out there for four days. So that's, you know, I mean, I think there are people that run Vision Quest now in very little preparation. You know, they, I know there's a woman in California, she does beautiful, stunningly beautiful work. It's absolutely beautiful work, but the person is not particularly prepared in survival sense. They're prepared spiritually. And the way she does it is there's a, uh, there's a base camp. So if anything's horribly wrong, you can just walk back to base camp. Um, I was, we were driving through the mountains of Canada. He pulled the truck over and said, okay, get out. I had no idea where I was. I knew what I had to go find because you know how to find your clearing, you know how to build your shelter, you know all those things. Um, and it was for four days, three nights. Yes. The, and I said, you know, he said, I'll just be back in four days. And you're just left out there. And the idea of the vision quest is that you, you fast and you pray. So you make, your, you make your circle of protection. You call in the directions. You call in all the ancestors and spirits to come and teach you and be with you. Um, and you live out there and the animals come to visit you and check up on you and see how you're doing. Because it's Canada and there's a lot of wildlife. It's yeah. just beautiful. So I had bears come. I had raccoons come. I had a skunk came. Um, the bear stayed right behind my little shelter through the whole time, just stayed with me. Um, and that goes on and you, you, you know, you're asking for, is this correct? Can I understand my role? You know, do I have guides that are going to be working with me? Do I have a spirit song? So, and there are lots of the teachings for my vision quest were about being a, an initiated shaman at this time. And that this, this is the time of no secrets. This is the time of sharing. This is, you know, they said, look, there was a time, you know, my ancestors would, would tell me that there was a time when we had to keep all these things secret because the culture was going to be annihilated. So you had to hide these things and keep them hidden. But now in my generation, luckily, we're at the time where that's over now. Well, more or less over. Um, and it's about sharing the medicines and sharing the teachings. So I was kind of understanding that the reason I was passed to so many different cultures and different tribes was because it was up to me to meld all that together. So. And is that the possibilities that you open up for other people now through merging all those different, all the different wisdom from all those different tribes? Because 
you know, these, it sounds like these are not the kind of experiences that you see as you did that first advert with white bear these are not uh, courses or initiations that are advertised you get passed round and and so it's not for everybody it's not you choose it it chooses you those tribes to choose you so having gone through all of that what possibilities do you feel that you that pulls together for you to open up for other people now I think it makes it incredibly accessible. And I think one of the possibilities is that I'm to understand that my training as a shaman and the, the things that I've learned to do are bridges for people. And I think my job is to present that bridge and say, come on, because possibility will only exist if you cross the bridge. Possibility only exists if you're willing to ask, if you're willing to try. That's the door to possibility, right? You can't Absolutely. just, yeah. So there has to be an, an active choice that you make or just be curious. And I think when people are curious that my, because I'm not, this is the tradition and this is the way it is and that you have to be in this particular discipline or this particular tradition, I think more people find me accessible. I think they find me more practical and accessible and I think, that's that grounded approach only can come because it wasn't this weird thing that I did an, on one weekend. You know, I lived this for a year and a day and now 35 years that I have, you know, this has been my spiritual discipline. And I think that is just, I know where the doors of possibility are. So when someone's curious, I go, ah, right. You're curious from your tradition Come here, the door, your possibility door, it's right there. Come here, let's go across the bridge. And then they have to open the door. But I think I can lead them to the door because it's been so many different disciplines in so many different countries. So is that why um, the reason that people come to you to help open in the, those doors of possibility? Or do they come for healing, for ceremony? What are the reasons people would seek you out? All, all of the above. Um, I, became, I became a licensed celebrant, so I could do marriages and funerals and death midwifing. So sometimes I've done a little, quite a lot of death midwifing. Sometimes they come for healing. Um, most of them come because somebody has said, oh, you know, Eagle Heart, you know, is this shaman that I know? And they go, you know, I've always been curious. So I always get the people that say, well, I've always been, I've always been a little bit curious. And I'm like, well, come on. So I do public ceremonies as well. So I do equinoxes and solstices and I've always done those publicly. And then I carry a sacred pipe that's a new moon pipe. So every new moon I do a ceremony and um, sometimes there's a lot of people and sometimes it's only private groups, but they hear about that. So I'm kind of like this, this entryway into this incredible world of, of shamanic practice. And so I think that's together, mostly all, what Yeah, bringing together all those different um, traditions. Now, you just mentioned that your shaman name is Eagle Heart. Was that a name you were given? I was given that by two different medicine men. So that's when you kind of go, okay. So one of my principal teachers was a, a medicine man in, in the Rocky Mountains of Canada, Grey Wolf. And so when I, he's the one that threw me out on Vision Quest. And he said, you know, your medicine name is Eagle Heart. And I thought, oh, okay. I didn't like it. I didn't like that name. I thought I didn't know what it really meant. I didn't know. But a good medicine name you grow into, it's never the one that you go, oh, yes, of course, that's me. And it's never a sense of ego. You always have a sense of, I hope I deserve this name. I hope I can live up to this name. And you just grow into that. So then when I was down in Oklahoma, um, Bond's grandmother just started calling me Eagle Heart. And I thought, oh, that's weird. Why does she, you know, how does she know? Of course, of course she knows. But so she said, I think that has to be your name. Has that been, she said, has that been tribally given to you? And I said, well, I think so. And she said, well, let's make sure then. So she did a full naming ceremony for that. So I got the naming ceremony confirmed in Oklahoma, the name given in Canada, and um, someone jokingly said to me, 
you know why you're named Eagleheart? And I said, why? And they said, because you'll find a way to love anything. <laughs> and what a beautiful quality that is. How wonderful. And of course, do they also, because as the eagle, do they assign that as your spirit animal? No. 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 Eagle, no, I'm not, I'm not a big eagle guy. Um, I see them. They're very friendly. Um, but nope, it's not one of my it's not one of my spirit allies. I've got the bear, absolutely. Bears and wolves, but bears, I mean, there are so many hysterical stories of being out in the wild with bears and me. Okay, well, maybe uh, those stories are some of the stories we'll be sharing over our next series of, of interviews, because I know this, we can also weave into, um, you know, sight whispering, tree whispering, the different ceremonies and the healing that you do um, when people cross over, when spirits are stuck, helping them through. There are so many different areas that I know that we're going to be talking about, and I really wanted to allow people to get to know you during this session. <laughs> your journey and your, you know, the wonderful experiences that you had with all those different tribes and how unique that is to have had the gift of being handed from tribe to tribe to tribe. And really, you know, from the age of 27, uh, when you're sat and hit home to be set on a completely different path and being open to it in a way that it changed the trajectory of your life and opened the door to new possibilities and as you said you have the opportunity to help other people open doors for new possibilities themselves with the work that you do yes i tried i tried once to choose and uh it was oh i don't remember what what year it was i was at a, a medicine gathering again a tribal gathering in canada so i was part of the anyway there was a sacred fire and so you, the sacred fire has to be tended. So you sign up for duty to tend the fire. And it's a beautiful experience because it's you are the fire keeper to keep this sacred fire burning through the whole period of the days that this medicine gathering is going to go. So it's a really cool responsibility. So I signed up for a 2 a, 2 a. m. shift. So it's a, you do it for, I think, two or three hour shift. And I thought, well, that'd be perfect. There won't be anybody there. I won't have to talk to anybody. It'll just be me and the ceremonial fire. So I prepared a bundle of press clippings and all my things that represented my professional life as a director. So I had this bundle of, of all these things. And I had that and I took that to the fire. And so I pushed it toward the fire and saying, you know, if this is, if this is what I need to do, if I need to say goodbye to this previous life that I had as a famous theater director, so be it. And on with the shaman work, let's go. So I pushed this into the fire and these spirits said, take that out. I pulled it back and I thought, oh my God, I thought, oh, newsprint, maybe there was plastic. You know, I was like, <laughs> okay, I was contaminating the fire. I didn't know what I'd done. And so I, I'm holding the bundle, feeling like, uh-oh. And they said, no, we don't need anybody staying in the, in the community anymore. We don't want you staying um, on, on as, as an Aboriginal way, you would say staying on country. We need you out in the world. We need you to take this work this healing work, this shamanism, and live it in, in the average life, in the, in, the, in the ordinary reality. We don't need you back living with us in the village or in the community. We need you out. So it's like, okay. And then it's just been this wild journey, and now I'm living in Australia. Yes, you've lived in many, many different places, and we'll certainly get into that in, in um, further conversations. I know you have so much wisdom to share and you know you've you've just given a, a beautiful insight that you know the fire told you no we need you out into the world and many people are feeling yes i need to be out in the world i need to be doing more so what can people your path was sort of mapped for you and you were passed around you know, and, and you said you, you wanted to attend sessions, but it was like, no, you were pushed back into the real world. What can people do? What's some tangible wisdom you can share with our audience now for people who are feeling a little bit, you know, the world's in chaos, it's changing. What can we do now that's practical so that they're almost igniting their own shaman within themselves? I think there's a couple of things that I would recommend people do. I think one is to connect with nature in whatever way you can. 
and you know, take your shoes off and hug a tree. Watch the sunset. Stand, you know, barefooted and let the waves lap toward you. Anything that you can do that just that sense of surrendering from being this tiny little insular human to being an expanded part of nature. I would encourage everyone to just do that, do that every day if you can. But if this is something that you think, well, I don't know, just do that. Just because nature will absorb you. Nature will accept you. Nature will teach you. So I would say one, you know, make, go make friends with nature. Find a tree to be your friend. <laughs> the second thing is because we have intellects, I think there's always going to be intellectual curiosity. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a start reading. So maybe one of the things that you and I can do is put together a bit of a reading list for people yes. to say, look, I think in terms of shamanism, these are a couple of safe places to start. I think sign up for that weekend course. Just know that that's not the end, that that can't give you everything you need. And that, that won't give you the tools to keep you safe. There are dangers to the shamanic work. Absolutely there are. When you open yourself to spirit, there's good and there's, there's bad spirit. So you've got to really be careful about, and if you're going to do soul journey, you better know how to get back. And I think a lot of the people that I encounter that have done those little, those courses, you know, will go off into ceremony and they get lost. Yes. And I think that's scary. So I think take those courses, but you know, careful. I think that's the, that can be the beginning of your journey. And then I think the best thing of all is to stick with people like you. Because you know, I'm, I don't mean this just as flattery, but you're connected to a network of really, really incredible medicine people. Really authentic people with incredible integrity. So I think that when you find, when people find someone like you, if they're curious, just keep following. And if people, when they listen to me, they go, oh yes, that makes sense. Then get in touch with me. If they, if, um, if, um, uh, Matthew, Ryan, I was going, Ryan, no, that's the surname. If, if Matthew <laughs> makes sense to them, go there. You know, whatever, whoever you can, wh whoever's in your network would be people that they should listen to and follow and make connections to. Because we've got to get going. And if you've got a feeling that there's something bigger than you, if you're curious about it, please don't wait. Tomorrow, there's no reason to, the door of possibility is there. Look, it's there, right there. <laughs> Oh, yes, we, that door. we are pure brilliance and, and I love the fact of you know it's not just going in nature it's it's expanding when you're in nature feeling the expansion and the expanse of nature the sea a sunset to expand yourself that we're not just this individuated self that we are so huge and as you do that then you are attracted to the right books the right people or you you start to trust your intuition in a way that allows you to go on that program or be attracted to this or this or that person. It just happens very organically as yep. you know your journey from being passed from here to here to here. What an incredible story. And I certainly look forward to hearing more of those adventures as we dig deeper into the different aspects of the work um, the very important work that you do, uh, as I said, from sight whispering, tree whispering, the connecting with the 44 grandmothers, the pipes, all of that. So I want to take this time to thank you so much for sharing um, how you came to be doing the wonderful work that you do. And I will speak to you again very soon. And uh, your website will be in the details on the podcast and video. Thank you so Great. much. My pleasure.